welcome again to our wonderful participation. It's now my pleasure to introduce Zeynep Lütgren Çeteles, who is working as a founder at Beyond Biological Products Limited. She will give presentation titled Bio Entrepreneurship Definition and How It Shapes Future World, Importance and New Opportunities. Examples from different startup and business models. Hello to everyone. Uh, firstly, I thank so much to Near East University organizing committee for this uh, valuable uh, symposium. And uh, before starting my presentation, uh, I would uh, really thank to Melissa Kivan for the previous uh, presentation because she really gave brief information about uh, entrepreneurship and innovation. Uh, I uh, tried to uh, give examples uh, from more agri-tech, environment-tech and uh, bioengineering fields during my presentation. I hope all of you enjoy. Uh, yes, I'm a biologist. Uh, I graduated from Hacettepe University and after uh, graduation, I uh, found my company and started up my business. Uh, my career started my uh, company, so I wanted to give a summary about how was the uh, process. I thought that uh, it can be a good example for uh, bio entrepreneurs. Uh, in Turkey, uh, 2009, uh, Turkish Ministry of Industry and Trade started a support, techno entrepreneurship support, and uh, we are the first techno entrepreneurs, I can say. Um, also, during my university and master studies, I uh, worked on pesticide detection. And uh, I know that that was a really uh, important problem for uh, environment. And my uh, first idea uh, was on remediation of pesticide residues uh, by soil microorganisms. Uh, I can say uh, details uh, at features like that. Uh, techno entrepreneurship support now turned to a big program, and it can be a thing like a seed funding. Uh, and if you want to run business and continue, you should uh, take uh, other financial supports or for bio entrepreneurs, especially because it's really taking a time. Uh, to go on a last product or a services uh, model. So we take a cost cap R&D support and other supports during the process. But um, uh, at the same time, uh, our service models and our products start to occur and uh, sales started. Uh, you can find detail information also our web page but i want to uh, give uh, another uh, information about our ecolite project because it's a, a special um, it has a special environment award from the united nations global clean tech innovation program uh, it was our first uh, trial field trial application project for our company in Ankara to Bukaragöl, and we work with the Ministry of uh, Water Affairs and Forestry at uh, 2014 to 17, uh, three years. And we applied benthic barriers uh, first time in Turkey, and it was important for a microfite uh, control. Uh, we get really uh, good results on that project. And at the same time, uh, our uh, product development and uh, European Union uh, partnership projects came because uh, while realizing an R&D project, uh, you are becoming expert on some uh, experiment designs, field trials, and uh, this is uh, becoming another experience for uh, and new uh, beginnings for other projects, I can say. Uh, for instance, one of our uh, device products is Lestatec. This is also, uh, yeah, we started uh, with soil, but this device uh, is applicable for many, many uh, analyses. For instance, uh, for now, we are 
trying to do some uh, tissue or uh, bacteria detection with the system we are uh, trying. Uh, and uh, it is portable, it, is, uh, it uh, sustains multi-element detection in just seconds uh, timing. And again, I suggest you to look at IPM for Citrus Project web page uh, for details. Uh, it is a biopesticide development project and the coordinators are from uh, France and Tunisia. Uh, they are producing uh, biopesticides and they have really uh, good biofermentation facilities. Uh, the uh, Bacillus thuringiensis uh, based uh, biopesticides and uh, we are realizing here the target and non-target uh, toxicology tests and field tests on citrus uh, plants as SME partners. And uh, I'm also working as managing partner at the prime company too, and they are uh, working based on the uh, life sciences uh, molecular biology regions. I wanted to give this as an uh, example too, because um, for instance, uh, magnetic particle-based PCR purification kits, uh, it was an R&D project and it uh, go through the uh, product last product and it's now uh, sailing on in Turkey and different countries and also with the know-how uh, developing uh, molecular biology uh, regions uh, during the COVID process a company produced uh, some uh, viral transport solutions and similar products and uh, they uh, get really uh, good sales and success on the market so yeah for instance, developing this kind of this, uh, products taking five years, six years period. But if you can uh, get success, then at last you can uh, uh, continue uh, sale product, I can say. Yes, now uh, I want to tell a bit about via entrepreneurship. And I wanted to start with the uh, Steve Jobs uh, important view. 21st century will be really uh, biggest innovations uh, century for biotechnology. We are, uh, we can think that we're at the beginning. Also, we are living this. And uh, I want to, to emphasize difference between entrepreneurship and bio entrepreneurship because uh, bio entrepreneurship should uh, produce solutions for global problems. Uh, health, environment, agriculture, and uh, you don't need mostly uh, really deep or high scientific knowledge. Basic and applica applicable scientific knowledge uh, is really important. And uh, innovation and uh, sustainable solutions are really important and really uh, gay uh, work to future world. Uh, yeah, biotechnology, bio is life and normally uh, general health tech is uh, coming on our minds. This is uh, so uh, logical because um, on our uh, days, uh, especially with the effects of the news, uh, life tech and health tech companies are really getting big investments because uh, with the effect of pharma and medicine sector, uh, but uh, you should also think on the agriculture and uh, environment, bio-based polymers and uh, bioengineering. These are also needed really uh, innovations and new ideas. Uh, and you can be sure that a really near future, uh, we will be hearing uh, good and big investments and important projects, companies on that field too. Uh, being an entrepreneur can be a bit easier, but uh, being a bio entrepreneur uh, needs some uh, struggling uh, periods, I can say, because uh, really uh, you shouldn't uh, start with just an idea. You should test it or you should have an invention especially you should have a lab proof. I know that there are some funding mechanisms just supporting your idea and you are starting, but mostly um, 
they are uh, finishing with uh, unsuccessful uh, stories. So I really suggest you that uh, starting with a really tested, especially lab or field tested um, ideas or projects. And uh, this really uh, decreasing uh, on time for developing uh, product or services, uh, especially on these sectors. And uh, you will depend on strict regulations on the all fields of uh, biotechnology. Uh, you will need to get uh, declarations, certificates, standard uh, documents, ethical approvals mostly. And uh, many of you shouldn't uh, go to last product in one year, minimum three years to 10 years, uh, according to the needs of your business model and your product, the product development process takes time. And that means that you require uh, huge financial support and investments uh, to continue to run your business during this process. Uh, yes, there are higher risks than other entrepreneurship areas, but uh, if you get success, it is really uh, worth to uh, do it, I can say. Uh, because uh, you are, we are not talking about especially financial part, uh, we should talk uh, on the uh, which kind of benefits we are creating for uh, humanhood and world maybe. Uh, I just wanted to uh, give really common uh, knowledge about the uh, today's uh, problems. For instance, more than uh, 820 million people are hungry and at the same time, 650 million adults are obese in our today world. And uh, many of people uh, are getting really uh, dying and uh, really uh, living important illnesses uh, because of just uh, these causes. And last year, until last year, we lost 2.8 million people just because of uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And also we have really important environmental problems too with the effects of pollution. Uh, for instance, one million spaces are uh, threatened with extinction, and uh, this is just no estimated total. Uh, scientists tell that it's coming to eight millions. And uh, marine pl plastic pollution, I'm sure that uh, you know this uh, information, but uh, if you look at detail news, now there is another. Uh, important pollution problem with the effect of plastic pollution, microplastics. And uh, microplastics uh, will be our future uh, bigger problem because uh, they are uh, causing many health problems to also, uh, they are also uh, transferring to our uh, body as you can guess. But with the uh, biotechnology, we can really uh, produce sustainable solutions. Uh, normally, maybe you can see uh, this news at the futurism or uh, new uh, idea uh, news, under the new idea news, but now they are really getting commercializing. I put here as a lab grown meat example, but uh, if you look at a bit, uh, you will see that also fish meat and other meat types too. And they are uh, really passing to the uh, big productions and they are starting to selling uh, these products. Why we need lab grown meat? Because uh, world hunger uh, amounts will be uh, especially in 2050 in bigger uh, amounts. And we uh, really need uh, more sustainable solutions for our future world with less energy, fewer greenhouse gas and with less lands and maybe producible in everywhere of the world. And also I wanted to give another example, especially uh, this can be think a biomimicry example too. Uh, living concrete. Uh, normally, these kind of resources are realizing for the um, 
producing new construction materials for uh, space uh, exhibitions or uh, resort, but uh, these can be uh, really used on uh, as a construction material for our future buildings too. Uh, and it is just uh, made with sand gel and bacteria, for instance. Uh, there are some different examples on that uh, construction materials too, for instance, uh, not producing uh, greenhouse gases, also sourcing uh, with the modeling from the uh, the uh, coral reefs uh, classification model. Uh, these are really uh, good uh, biotechnology and bioentrepreneurship uh, business model and research models, I can say, because also they are on, uh, many of them are on sale and uh, on application. And uh, I wanted to uh, give other examples, especially for business part. Uh, for instance, uh, next generation Secusing. I'm sure that at university and also during this symposium, you will hear about it a really uh, good brief uh, from your academicians. Uh, but I just really want to say that uh, NGS, by the help of NGS system, now many of the rare diseases genetic diseases can detect uh, really short processes. And um, now it is in our daily life. By the help of this, uh, you can get results just in a week or two weeks. And this is really important for also the uh, cancer patients, uh, for uh, pregnant mothers, uh, because uh, it really uh, helps you to see uh, what will your uh, illnesses will go on. It can be which kind of treatment uh, should be used. Uh, and I want to tell that, especially next generation sequencing, yes, as sequencing technology, but bioinformatics parts are also important and supporting this technique. Uh, if you really think on that field too, uh, that's a really uh, big area and features a future area uh, for study and uh, being experts on, I can say. And uh, another example I wanted to give on Labona chip, uh, especially uh, one of uh, our uh, University of France now, she's, uh, she uh, finished her uh, postdoc and uh, she's working at 20 University in Burju. Uh, double chip sustains, you detect really one millimeter uh, detection limit with just a single chip. And uh, there are lots of applications and uh, really turns on uh, easy last products. For instance, uh, I put here a video about the uh, malaria detection system. And uh, at the Africa, they, are st they started to use this for fast detection. Also, uh, you can uh, see different examples just uh, extracting proteins from one single uh, cell to uh, see the uh, tissue structure. There are lots of uh, good examples and really turning on the last product examples. If you interest, I really uh, advise on uh, research or study on that field too. And yes, uh, 3D bioprinting. Uh, now, uh, with the uh, 3D printer technology and the new uh, material science, uh, we really started to produce uh, tissue and uh, organ production uh, trials, of course, for now, but in a really near future, maybe in five years, we will see that uh, that can be producible with the stem cells uh, for uh, people-specific uh, uh, organs. And 
we believe that many people's life uh, will can uh, save by help of it. Also, uh, 3D bioprinting uh, uh, are used in the bones, especially for a while, maybe for 10 years, I can say, at the uh, surgeries too, and for uh, skin healing also. And there are really lots of research and needed at that field too. Um, I also wanted to talk a bit about the uh, bioentrepreneurship ecosystem. Uh, I don't know, maybe you heard uh, from the uh, startup hubs, especially all over the world now, the uh, biotech hubs are increasing. And uh, for the bioentrepreneurship and bio ideas development, I think this is a really important and necessary model uh, because uh, when you start up, uh, uh, also you have an uh, innovation or also you have an tested maybe prototype product, you should uh, need uh, a laboratory or you should need the cold storage rooms. You will need a facility and at first step, uh, find, uh, find that uh, financial support to fund up all the uh, infra infrastructure is not easy. So biotech hubs are sustaining this to you. Also, they have experiment labs, also manufacturing labs, prototype trial, and also the big manufacturing units. And you can just uh, getting service uh, sustained needs and uh, you can really go to your last product with uh, lower uh, financial needs and they gave support to you on business development investor relations and uh, they can support you also uh, uh, funding uh, and additional financial support too so if you are planning to be a bio entrepreneur i strongly suggest you to uh, find a suitable uh, biotechnology startup uh, for you and start from there um, for now, especially uh, United States and United Kingdom are uh, really far away on that uh, model. But in Europe, there are really good uh, biotechnology startup hubs too. They also uh, give academic support to, uh, for instance, normally we are telling that going to a last product minimum three years, but with the infrastructure and academic experience, you can go in six months or one year too. This uh, biotechnology startup hub's importance is coming uh, from here. And you can see your uh, uh, business model or you, your product can be valuable on market or not at the beginning. Uh, this is important too, uh, to uh, also continue or stop or change uh, your projects. And I wanted to give uh, a little uh, information about the uh, fundings uh, terminology. Uh, when you are starting with the, your business, uh, you need mainly early stage fundings and uh, you can get from your friends, families or seed fundings. Generally, uh, governments give seed fundings to from university or for directly startup uh, based uh, fundings. But after passing this uh, process, uh, you are uh, becoming grower and you need more financial uh, support. Uh, for instance, Series A, Series B, and uh, being public, and I'm uh, sure that you are hearing about the unicorns, especially for the um, um, information technologies, uh, computer science technology field innovations. Uh, this situation is same for uh, health tech and bio startups too. And uh, now the investment mechanisms are really uh, getting more um, better. You can uh, reach them and you can realize your pitch tech. 
presentations and when they see that uh, your business model and product is uh, going on a uh, good way, uh, they are supporting. Uh, for seed funding, just I wanted to uh, give uh, these examples. For Turkey, uh, Tubitak Big uh, program uh, is now a uh, uh, really common seed funding program. And uh, European Union Horizon uh, programs has uh, not seed funding, but for uh, second step funding, I can say, because uh, now uh, until the last year, they gave importance on the uh, partnership and uh, commercialization of uh, product. That means uh, from prototype go to the uh, bulk production or uh, international marketing. And uh, as I told you about UCIP, uh, there are uh, field specific uh, funding mechanisms too. For instance, uh, for environment and climate change projects, GCIP can be a nice incubation program too, but for health sciences, for agricultural sciences, uh, you should check uh, according to your uh, R&D startup project. And uh, now uh, I wanted to give uh, this Congress information to you if you interest, because it's just uh, in four days, uh, Bio Expo of Turkey, and there are sectoral informations uh, you can get uh, about the latest uh, products, latest uh, business types. And thanks so much. I can get your uh, questions uh, for answering. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation. Uh, we have two questions for you. Uh, one of them, what are the challenges in growing meat and food in love, like cost, time, etc.? Are there any possible health risks of consuming this food? Uh, actually, uh, I suggest you uh, look at uh, research articles about that and also the uh, latest product news. If you want, I can uh, share related uh, links uh, for you too. Uh, yes, uh, of course, this is a question and uh, trials should be realized for the, are there any uh, health effects? But uh, for now, uh, for uh, according to the experiment results, uh, they see that as, as a uh, quality, the food quality, it is really uh, better, uh, mostly better uh, than the uh, production because they can control, for instance, uh, heavy metal or antibiotic uh, loading on it. And uh, they can, uh, they are going to be, uh, they are realizing this production with the tissue engineering uh, methods and they can realize it uh, with really uh, organic uh, polymer based. So uh, for now, uh, of course, uh, maybe future years, we can see more detailed research and results. But for now, uh, it uh, seems like that uh, health in enough uh, health level and good quality for consumption uh, because also I can tell at uh, fish uh, meats uh, for instance fish meats really with the pollution of the uh, seas uh, they have really uh, microplastics and heavy metals and uh, other things loaded too and it's causing important uh, health uh, problems too I can answer like that and I can uh, send you uh, to look at the tail information links. Thank, thank, thank you. Uh, next question is, 
What role do you suggest institutions should play to help students to transit from ideation to action? For uh, for bio entrepreneurship, if for who want to be bio entrepreneurs, uh, actually you should. I shouldn't suggest. Uh, you should uh, search and find the best one. But I really wanted to show here the options uh, because um, most of us after graduation starting from our universities. But uh, some universities have this support mechanism uh, for entrepreneurship. Some universities doesn't have. According to your uh, project, according to your idea, uh, you should look at where is the most suitable place. Because uh, also uh, by your startups, focus areas changing to some of them uh, can focus health sciences, some of them can focus agri-tech. Uh, and some of them focusing food tech, and uh, these are important also for commercialization. Commercialization part two. Uh, you should uh, research according to your project and select uh, according to the conditions uh, which one is uh, best thing to you. Uh, thank you so much. Our question is that. Thank you too. <laughs> uh, thanks uh, everyone for sharing time also uh, during the uh, all presentation and symposium. And thanks so much questions. You can keep in uh, touch with me from my LinkedIn or mail address. Thanks again. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, dear participation, please welcome Dr. Adam Chambers, who will give his pre presentation titled Oxford Expression Technologies Flashback System. Hello. Hello. Hi there. Uh, um, hopefully everyone can see my slides and hear me clearly. So thank you for that introduction. So I'm, I'm Adam Chambers. I'm a principal scientist at Oxford Expression Technologies, a company based in the UK. Um, I lead the contract service side of the company and some of the research programs that are currently going on. And today I'm going to talk about the company itself and the flashback system. So basically my presentation layout, I'm going to talk about the company, OET, and then an introduction to the Baclavaris system and then talk about the expression system using the baclavirus. So OET was founded as a spin-out in 2007 from two research groups, one at Oxford Brookes University, uh, led by Professor Linda King, and the second from NERC, led by Professor Robert Posse. Um, the company itself is based at the Tong Building at Oxford Expression, Oxford Brookes University. And we're classed in as SME because we have less than 250 employees and don't have an income of 40 million pounds per year. Um, we are experts on the back of our expression system. Um, we use other expression systems in house though, such as E. coli or mammalian, and the company owns the pattern for the flashback system. So I'm just gonna talk about the structure of OET, how it works as a company. So we have um, three streams of income. We have kits and products. Uh, where we sell the flashback system and other reagents so people can use the system in their own labs and set it up. Um, we also have the contract service side where clients come to us and they want us to express their recombinant um, gene. And these can vary from different projects. So you can have early stage R&D, uh, virus-like particles, vaccine diagnostics. So for a diagnostic, you could have a recombinant target you want to use an analyzer or something like that. Um, or we could also produce active enzymes. Um, and then we have licensed income as well. So this is basically people that are using our flashback system because it's patented. They have to pay us a small income, a small license fee, should I say. Um, so this all generates an income. And then obviously some of this we put back into the company for in-house and collaborative R&D projects. Um, and here's a list of four examples that we're working on. So um, improving the expression vector system, cell lines, vaccines, and diagnostic tools, um, 
So my colleague, uh, Dr. Mina Axelow, will talk more about one of the vaccine programs we're working on after my talk today. And obviously this is supported by grant income. So we do apply for grants and that. And so this is helping fund some of this work. And the whole point of our R&D is to develop new products and services, which then loop back into the categories given before. So you kind of have a simplified ver uh, version of OET structure and how a company uh, could be set up to work to generate income and then use that to generate research projects and then use the results of these research projects to generate new products and services. So now I'm going to go into some of the biology of the baclovirus now and introduce that because it is quite an interesting virus and as a virologist I am interested in um, viruses. So, um, so the baclovirus itself is an insect-specific virus. It's a double-stranded DNA virus with quite a large genome. So we're talking up to 180 kilobytes pair. Um, interesting thing about the baclovirus is it has a biphasic replication cycle and has two distinct phenotypes. So if you, um, most common uh, example nowadays is the COVID-19. It has a single phenotype, whereas the baclovirus has two distinct structures. So it has a budded virus form that, as the name suggests, it buds from the um, plasma membrane. And this forms involved in infecting the tissue of the insect, so from one tissue to another or from one cell to another. In its second form, it has an inclusion-derived virus where you can have multiple nuclear capsids in. So this example, it has three nuclear capsids, so that's three separate genomes, all wrapped into a single envelope virus. And then this is actually packaged into a matrix, an occlusion body made of this polyhedron protein. And this occlusion body is really important because you're infecting a host that is seasonal. So the larvae might emerge a year after the first round of infection, over a year after. So you need to have um, to protect the virus. So this is what the occlusion body does. It protects the virus from um, UV damage, uh, desiccation, so drying out while it's in the environment sitting there. And these occlusion bodies are quite large structures. So this is just a light microscope image of occlusion bodies. These are not cells. These are actually the occlusion bodies. Um, produced from cell culture, and you can see the clumps of them where they've not broken up, but each circle here is actually an occlusion body. So they're large enough to see under a microscope. Um, and an interesting fact, um, if you eat a lot of lettuce, uh, you probably digest between uh, 10, between 10,000 occlusion bodies, something like that per year. So that's an interesting fact. Um, so the primary infection route, as I said, so the polyhedron, uh, the collusion body, should I say, sorry, uh, sit in the environment. Uh, they're digested by the larvae form of the insect. It goes through the foregut into the midgut. The midgut has uh, an alkaline pH. This causes the uh, occlusion body to break down slowly and then release the ODVs. Now, the ODVs then have to penetrate a membrane, which is designed to protect the midgut cells, which is trying to infect. So either it will go through um, some damage in this paratrophic membrane, or it will, it has um, proteins on its surface that will actually uh, break the membrane down and allow it to pass. So once it's um, started an initial infection in the cell, it looks more like this. So you have the, the um, virus particle enter into the endosome, the nucleus, the nuclear capsid escapes from the endosome, is delivered into the nucleus, you get DNA replication, formation of new nuclear capsids, and during early, early infection, these nuclear capsids are transported out of the nucleus, across the cytoplasm, and they bud from the cell, forming the first form, the budded virus. And then these go on to infect um, further cells and tissues within the larvae. And on the surface of the plasma membrane, it's been modified to carry the envelope protein GP64. And that's involved in attachment. Interestingly, when you get to the le very late stage of infection, the nuclear capsids stop being transported across and out of the nucleus. Instead, they are switched and they are maintained in the nucleus and they form the ODVs. Now, the OVD, ODV form gets its envelope from the nucleus, actually. And then they're put into the occlusion bodies, like I said earlier. And then the cells lies and then they're released into the environment and then the re reinfection of a new host can occur. Um, 
so we talk about a lot about human viruses, but um, we, we get it easy when you talk about viruses because um, a lot of other viruses have devastating effects um, to the insect or, or the animal before it dies. So, for example, um, this one on the left side is actually an infected um, insect. And basically, this is the end result. The um, virus literally liquefies the host down into nothing. And you have a healthy insect here, which is happily eating its uh, dead brother, sister, or whatever you want to call it, and then starting the reinfection because the caterpillar just sees this as a rich source of protein carbohydrates. Um, so the closest virus that infects human would be Ebola, um, which causes hemorrhage, but nothing to this extent in the human body. So um, when you're thinking of applications of the BACA virus, the first one that might come to mind is a pesticide because it's, um, it's biological, it's target specific, um, so, and it's safe in that regard, where you use chemicals which will wipe out a whole ecosystem of insects which are needed for a healthy environment. So baccaloviruses do make good pesticides and they are used in Germany extensively in uh, tree grove, uh, apple grove, sorry. Um, oh, sorry. Um, the, but what I'm gonna focus on in the talk today is actually the expression system. And in the expression system, you only really need the uh, budded virus form because you're gonna use um, tissue culture, cell culture to infect. You can infect the larvae and produce recombinant proteins that way, but it's, it's um, more costly. So we're gonna talk more about using cell culture to produce recombinant proteins. And some of the recombinant proteins that OET is interested in is uh, for vaccines, diagnostic and gene therapy purposes. So now I'm gonna actually go into more talking about the expression system. Now you know a little bit, hopefully know a little bit more about the baclavirus itself. So, the baclavirus has a replication cycle, as I've already suggested earlier, but it's actually um, a cascade of events. So you have immediate early, early, late, and very late. So these uh, cascades have to happen one after the each other. And once you transition from early to late, you actually go from using the host RNA polymerase to using a viral RNA polymerase. And it's at the late stage you get the budded virus. So in when you're talking about tissue culture, Really, um, you only need this stage of the virus to make budded virus to infect the tissue culture. So anything else you can harness to produce a recombinant protein. And lucky for us, um, the very late promoters, polyhedron and P10, uh, which we can use to produce recombinant proteins, they're involved in um, phases that are not required for culture. They're not required for the budded virus. They also use a massive amount of resources of the cells. So when you look at a relative percent of gene expression, they're using just under about 40% of the gene expression of the cell during the very late phase, which is huge. And if you take these cells and you dry, dry it out and weigh dry mass, the polyhedron and P10, they take up over half the weight of a cell. So you have a lot of resources there that you could harness and use to make recombinant proteins instead. So from this point of view, it's a really useful system because as I said, um, you don't need this part of the infection for the cell culture. Um, other reasons it's beneficial is because it's a eukaryotic system, it um, provides post-translational modifications as you would expect from a mammalian system. And this is a contrast to um, prokaryotic, so bacteria systems, and also Yeast is a eukaryotic system, but it has a weird um, glycosylation pathway, whereas insects is more similar to mammalian system. Um, and also the insect cells can be grown in serum-free media, and they're easily scaled up from shape cultures, so 20 mils to 3 litres in a lab scale, up to 550 litres, and then all the way up to 200 litres plus. So when I say 200 litres plus, I'm talking 200,000 litres can be made especially for the flu vaccine that's made using the baclavirus. And they only need a temperature of 28, 27 to 28 degrees. So you're not needing to heat the bioreactor up because if you're using mammalian cells, as you may know, they need to be heated up to about 37 degrees. You also need to pump CO2 into them to make until in there to maintain the um, pH of the media, whereas that's not required for insect cells growth. So this is an advantage. The cost of production is a lot lower when you use insect cells. 
So I'm going to talk now about the actual flashback system. So as I said, this is owned by OET. So basically what you have here is you have the whole virus genome here, um, and it has a deletion in an essential gene, ORF1629. So we've knocked part of this gene out. So what that means is if you take this DNA and transfect or put it into insect cells, it can't spread infection because the ORF1629 is a, an essential gene. It's a structural gene of the nuclear capsid that contains the genome and is a part of the budded virus structure. So without this gene, it can't spread infection. So to amplify this DNA, we've had to insert a BAC or a bac bacterial artificial chromosome. So just think of this as a large plasmid that's maintained in bacteria. So we grow it up in bacteria, purify the DNA, and then we transfect insect cells along with a transfer plasmid, which is about four to five KB. So it's a lot smaller. This is just a standard plasmid. And in that plasmid, you would have inserted your target gene um, downstream of the polyhedron promoter. So you have the polyhedron promoter driving expression. And then you're flanked by the left two gene and then the complete ORF 1629. So then when you put these in the insect cell, the insect cell actually repairs the virus for you. It uses um, host um, proteins and a homologous recombination occurs. So you flip this fragment into the genome, resulting in a recombinant virus that then carries the target gene under the control of the polyhedron promoter. And you've also removed the bacterial artificial chromosome because you don't want this element left in the virus because it may be unstable. So we've removed. So now this has been removed and you've got your target gene. So this is it was a great step forward for the baccalaureate system because it meant it's a one step production. Previously, systems, you would have took the wild type virus. So it had been complete and infectious. Um, and then you would have linearized it. Um, put your transfer vector in, and then you would have a mix of recombinants and wild type. And then you would have to isolate your recombinant from the wild type virus. So you'd have a mixed population and you'd have to isolate. And on the next slide, if you look at the backpack system here, you can see this, this system is the old system. Um, people still use it though. It's still used around the world today. Um, but you can see actually doing this plaque purification stage, it can take two weeks. It could take actually an entire month to isolate your recombinant from the wild type. Um, so here we're being generous and we're saying 17 days until you get a virus stop you can do expression work with. But technically it could be longer than that. Um, the two main systems that I used are the back to back system. Um, the back to back system works similar to the flashback system, but it does the homologous recombination step in bacteria using transposons. So you have quite a few stages before you even get to starting virus production. Um, it's um, slightly faster than the old system, um, whereas the flashback system is a lot simpler because once you have the transfer vector, you just transfect the insect cells, you have a P0 stock or seed stock, and then you can amplify virus and then you can do expression work. So the flashback system is saving a lot more time and you also don't have to mess around using E. coli cells. So basically through the years, we've um, modified the virus genome to improve recombinant expression. Because as I said, the back of the virus has two phases and a lot of those proteins are redundant when you're using insect cell culture because you're not infecting the larvae that they've been designed to affect. So the first um, generation was the flashback. Then we had the flashback gold that had the chitinase that's missing in the flashback and the confection genes deleted. Um, and this made um, the system better for um, secreted proteins or proteins that need to go through the ER pathway. Um, this is mainly because chitinase blocks the ER pathway, it accumulates there during infection um, and stresses the ER. So if you look at the cells under uh, a confocal microscope and you put some ER markers in, you can see the ER is stressed because it's just packed full of the chitinase protein. Um, and then the cofepsin, also it's good to remove it because it's a protease. It's going to degrade your protein if your recombinant has a target site for it. So it will start cleaving your recombinant. And as I said, these two proteins are involved in the liquefaction of the insects. So that image I showed earlier of that um, larvae being liquefied, it's actually these two proteins that are involved in that process. So they're not required for the insect cell culture. 
Um, and the latest version is the Flashback Ultra. This lacks the P10 gene and some other non-essential genes. Um, and these enhance the stability of the late infection so that they allow the cells to hold together better. Also, we've removed the second very late promoter and its target gene. If you remember earlier in my earlier diagram, I said there's two very late promoters, one controlling the polyhedron. So that one's now used to express the recombinant gene, whereas the P10 is there still expressing the P10 gene. So now in the flashback ultra, that's been removed. So the hope is that all the resources that were split between the two very late promoters can now be directed all towards the polyhedron promoter. And on the next slide, I give some examples of some therapeutic targets that were compared um, independently. So this work was not done at OET. This was done um, off-site by an independent um, company. So basically, you've got the three versions of flashback. You've got flashback, you've got flashback gold and flashback ultra for four different targets. So you've got uh, beta galactose A. So this is lac -Z. So I'm sure a lot of you are aware of what this gene is. Um, so you can see that we see improvements as the versions go along. We have then three therapeutic targets. So you have a calcium dependent AT ATPase, a kinase, and a GTPase. All of these genes, these three genes are therapeutic targets as in they're involved in um, diseases in humans. So as you can see that they've, they've been expressed quite well, especially as the versions go along. Um, and this basically means the, these could go on to be further research. So you could do structural analysis. So you could, once you have a structure of a protein, you can then design peptides or drugs and you can see how they interact with the structure. So it's a really useful tool to be able to express um, therapeutic targets. Um, just to touch base on one of my interests, what I um, am currently using the flashback system to do, and that's to make virus-like particles. So to make a virus-like particle, you just take um, structural um, proteins of a virus and you express them. So this might be one um, protein, um, it could be several. And then you express them using the flashback system in insect cells, and then you purify the VLPs. So these are EM images of several VLPs that we've produced. Um, as you can see, they form quite nicely. Um, and basically, this opens up a vantage because the application for this is, is quite wide because you could use these as a vaccine. So they could be given to, a, to the population as a vaccine because it will have the structure of the virus and would hopefully produce a good immune response. Um, you could modify the structural protein and display something on the VLPs. So that has multiple applications because that could be then injected as a vaccine as well. It could be used to target um, cancer cells in a cancer patient and deliver a drug. Um, so there's multiple routes that these particles could be used. Um, they could also be used, which they are currently being used for. You, you can deliver um, DNA to a specific cell as well. So you could express a virus-like particle that's able to enter a specific cells, um, package a DNA target, and then allow that to be entered. So the next thing that I uh, touched on earlier was um, gene therapy. So baccaloviruses are quite interesting because um, they don't replicate in mammalian cells because none of the viral promoters are active. They don't drive expression, they can't express. And as I said earlier, if you don't get the early or immediate early expression of the viral promoters, then you get no other further replication. So because those early promoters aren't active in mammalian cells, it can't go to the late and very late stage. So this is an advantage because the baccalaureus is able to transduce mammalian cells. And what that means, it's able to enter them, but it doesn't infect them. Um, so what you can do is you can put your recombinant gene under control of a mammalian promoter such as CMV, it's a widely used mammalian promoter, um, and then transduce the mammalian cells and they will produce uh, recombinant protein from the mammalian cells. So this has an advantage of a therapeutic because um, compared to other mammalian based vectors that are being used this way, because there'd be no pre-existing immunity, you're not going to be um, exposed to baccaloviruses before in your bloodstream, should I say, because um, they don't infect humans, whereas some of the mammalian 
based vectors already circulate in the um, human population. So you have an immune response to them as well as um, the DNA fragment they might be carrying. So it's quite an interesting um, prospect. And basically when you're talking about baclavirus expression systems in this way, they're, they're termed Batman. So if you hit her, hear the Batman system, it's actually based on the baclavirus system, just using a mammalian promoter. So I'm just gonna briefly um, show some results. So these are HEC293 cells um, transduced with a baclavirus um, that carries um, the green fluorescent protein. So you can look at this under a fluorescent microscope and it will um, fluoresce green, basically. So we have the mock cells on the left, and then we have two infection conditions. We have uh, MOI100 and the MOI600. So this stands for multiplicity of infectivity. So basically, this means it's 100 virus particles per cell, whereas this is 600 particles per cell. So you can see the difference in a six-fold increase. You see a massive amount of fluorescent cells in, in the 600 MOI infection. And this is because we're transducing, we're not infecting. So you're only getting, you're getting no amplification of signal. You're just transducing the cells and getting the signal that managed to get to the nucleus and be expressed. Um, there is a lot of research in this area about modifying the, the baclavirus itself to express other viral um, envelope proteins to, to improve the transduction. Um, so one of them is the VSC envelope protein that's been um, expressed on the baclavirus budded surface to infect, not to infect, sorry, to transduce mammalian cells. And that shows that you can use a lot lower MOI going down to about 50. So the system does have um, promise, but it's a long way off before it actually be put into humans. Um, and then I just wanted to touch on um, some of the products that are, that are available uh, out there in the market at the moment. So um, there's quite a few veterinary vaccines. Um, a lot of them uh, are pig-based, uh, like the PCV ones. They're all pig-based vaccines. Um, and so it's the classic swan fever, to be honest, as well. So, um, so pig-based, because it's a huge market. So it just so it's promised that the common proteins that are produced in the baccalaureate system can produce an authentic immune response in, in animals, and then that protects them from disease. There are also human vaccines, so Cervavax, Cervavax sorry, um, and this protects against HPV serotypes 16 and 18 because they're involved, they're really important. Um, because they're involved in um, cancer formation. So, and Cervavax has been around for quite a while now. Um, flu boxes, flu block has come in quite recently. So as you imagine, this is a vaccine against flu. And this is targeted for people that have an allergic reaction to components in the eggs, because obviously the current flu vaccine that's mass manufactured is produced in eggs. Um, and some people can't take that vaccine because they're allergic to the components to the complements in the egg itself, which bleed through into the manufacturing process because of that. So they're not cleaned up. So people, some people can't take that and now taking the flu block. Um, there's also been some therapeutic um, targets as well. So um, the interesting one is, as I said, so you have an adeno associated virus vector. So this is using the baclavirus to produce uh, an a VLP, if you like, an adeno-associated virus vector that contains the human LPL variant. So it, on its surface, it contains this, and then that's been used as a gene therapy to uh, help with the disease, LPLD. Um, and one of big importance, I'm sure it's been brought up in several talks today, is obviously the COVID situation. You can't really get away from it. It's such a big um, thing of our generation. So Novavax, um, they've produced a recombinant-based uh, vaccine that uses the baclavirus expression system, and that's been shown to be around 90% efficiency, efficiency in the UK in a phase three trial. Um, and that's been given the green light to be used in the UK, and it's actually being manufactured some of the doses in the UK. So this is a good step forward again, because as more products come into the market using the baclaviruses, it then creates a pipeline in it it allows uh, future products to get through a lot easier because there's a lot of pre-existing safety data that's been accumulated by all these tests, which is really helpful. 
So just to summarize my talk, so hopefully you understand that the Baclavaris expression system is quick, easy, and efficient uh, way of producing complex recombinant proteins. Um, and these recombinant proteins have a wide range of application. I've only really touched on a brief uh, few aspects of the applications here. Um, so there's medicine, so you have therapeutic applications. So the first ones that come to mind um, is insulin production. That's recombinant now. Um, you also can get recombinant antibodies produced to treat certain diseases. Um, obviously, they're produced recombinantly because then they're a lot safer. If you're producing them from um, cell lines, then you have to ensure that the cell line is kept safe, um, doesn't have any um, infectious reagents in it and things like that. So recombinants, they can be purified and you know that they're, they're basically safer. Recombinants are normally classed as safer because you can clean them up a lot easier. And then there's research. Obviously, there's a wide range of applications here. Molecular biology, if any of you uh, have uh, set up a cloning reaction, done any DNA digest, done any RNA polymerase work, anything like that, qPCR, you're all using a recombinant now. All of those enzymes, or majority of them, are produced recombinantly. Um, if you go back 20 years ago, most of those were actually probably extracted from, from the um, organism. But now they're recombinant. They've been engineered to improve efficiency, stability, and things like that. Um, cell biology, so you can look at cell-cell interaction or protein-protein interaction, should I say. And then, as I touched on our, uh, earlier, structural and biophysical studies. So um, getting the structure of a recombinant pro well, of a protein target is really important because then, especially for drug discovery, because then you can use um, peptides or drugs um, on the model and you can see how they interact with it if they would bind into uh, a binding domain. So if you take the SARS cove, it has the uh, RDB binding domain. So if you, the structure of that's been resolved, so you can see how peptides will interact with that and also prevent it from binding. So then you lead back into the medicines and you have a therapeutic application. And then obviously there's a big um, area in the biotech uh, area. So in industry food production, um, a lot of, agricultural animals, um, cattle, sheep, um, chickens, their food supple is supplemented with hormones. And these hormones are now majority are made recombinant because, um, because obviously that's in our food chain. You don't want to be sourcing uh, hormones from the animals themselves or, or other animals because that then contaminates our food chain and we won't know what the effect is on us until that accumulates in, in 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 us in the humans ourselves and that they could build up and cause we don't know what kind of diseases or disorders so a lot of hormones that are added to feed now is actually their recombinants so 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 they're they're a lot safer and stuff like that agriculture as i said um safer pesticides that are recombinant and bioengineering um i just want to thank you for listening and i'm happy to take any questions i also want to thank the organizers for allowing me to uh, speak I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chambers. We have questions for you. Uh, one of them is, is there any specific species of insect that should be used for gene expression? Will the size of the target gene size affect its expression yet? Um, okay, that's a really good question. Thank you for that, um, Lily C. Um, so we're using cell culture here. Um, so we use um, from teenies and um, um, SF cells, basically. Um, and that's the main one that's used for insect cell production. there will be the two main cell lines um, that you look for. Um, how the baclavirus is structured um, in theory, the insert size it um, could go up, could be, um, how do I say this, uh, unlimited because of how the nucleocapsid of the baclavirus works. Basically, it's a spiral structure that just encases the genome. So it just keeps on growing as the genome grows. Um, the obviously you get with that is the nucleocapsid could form, but you're going to have instability. So the insert is always going to 
uh, have to be looked at because we we've inserted um, genes of 10 kb plus um, and they've been stable but we have other genes that aren't stable so it's all to do with the structure of the dna as well if you like and how well the virus will handle it i hope that answers your question Uh, thank you. Uh, other one is, does OAT deals in lamp expression system, molecular farming, for VL VLPS4 vaccines or small molecules for the rack? Um, actually, it's um, plant and yeast systems are the only systems we don't use at OET because um, they are, um, the plant system is um, different it uses um it needs different growth conditions also i'm not sure whether you're talking about a recombinant because you have plant cell lines now that can be used as expression or you're talking about actually expressing in the in, entire plant um so we don't have setups for those because they need um unique growth conditions and that um yeast for example we don't use because they grow in very similar conditions to the uh, insect cells um, and to, to avoid cross-contamination, we don't use yeast, for example. Um, so yeah, sorry, we don't, use, we don't do plant um, production. Okay, doctor, thank you. Uh, last question is, any purification steps for express molecules from using flashback? Uh, so, uh, any purification steps from using flashback? Um, so basically, normally um, we would use affinity tags. Um, HIS is the classic one. Um, so you can just lyse the cells, run them using a nickel column, IMAC purification. So, so we normally use HIS as our first target and purify it. Um, it might need a polishing set, step. So you use size exclusion chromatography after, for example, or ion exchange. Um, we have expressed a few targets where they've not been tagged. And we've used ion exchange and then size exclusion to purify those proteins. So, yes, the insect cell system, you can use any standard purification system out there to purify your recombinant. I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, this is all the questions. Oh, brilliant. Thank you. Thank you for joining. Thank you. Have a nice day. Bye. Dear participation, it's my pleasure to invite Dr. Mina Aksular, who will now give her present, presentation name, Permian Congo Hemorrhagic Fever Virus, Candidate Subunit Vaccines Produced in Insect Cells. Hi there, hopefully you can all hear me. Uh, yes, um, we can. Perfect, and you can hopefully see the slides. Um, I'm Mina Axelai, and like Adam Chambers, I work at Oxford Expression Technologies in England, and I'm the senior scientist who leads the vaccine projects in the company. Uh, we've just listened to Dr. Chambers um, about the flashback system, and my talk will be kind of a follow-up to give you an example how we can use the platform to apply and hopefully produce a potential product. So I would like to start uh, by giving you the outline of the talk. So hopefully I will give you a brief introduction to the target disease, which is Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever and its causative agent. I will then move on and explain you uh, the journey we had and still having as a small biotech company to try and generate a, a subunit candidate vaccine. I will also talk about our uh, future steps and finish with some concluding remarks. So to start with, um, Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever is a viral hemorrhagic disease and it is zoonotic, which means that it can cause disease. It can jump from animals to humans. And as you can see from these images, it could be quite a nasty disease. The causative agent for the disease is a virus from the same name, CCHF, and as the name is quite long, I will be referring to it as CCHF for the rest of the talk. Um, the CCHF virus was first identified in Crimea in 1944, 
And later on, quite a few years later, in Congo in 1956. However, uh, at the time, the technology wasn't advanced, so it took people quite a few years after this, up until I think 1969, to figure out that the virus that was first identified in Crimea and later on in Congo were actually identical. So they were exactly the same virus. Hence why, from then on, they started calling the virus Crimean Congo to recognize the two places it was first identified individually. The virus is endemic in many countries in Africa, the Middle East, Eastern Europe, Asia, and more recently in Turkey, Russia, and Spain. The virus is transmitted by ticks from hyaluronic species mainly or infected blood and tissue. So for example, uh, farm workers or veterinarians are quite at high risk because they, if they're dealing with infected animals, they are at risk of catching the virus from infected blood and tissue. And as the ticks are the um, reservoirs for the virus, actually it's quite uh, difficult to control the spread of the virus, especially nowadays with the climate change, as the tick um, um, distributes geographically, this means that we increase the risk of spreading the disease to many more countries. Unfortunately, the fatality could be quite high, up to 40%, and there is absolutely no uh, currently available licensed vaccines to um, target the disease. The main demand for vaccine is in the low middle income countries, and unfortunately, CCHF, like many other diseases, have been listed as a neg neglected disease because there is very low market and absolutely no interest from large biopharma companies to put money and effort into to produce uh, vaccines. However, luckily, in more recent years, WHO, World Health Organization, has put together a list uh, called Blueprint so that their aim is to target these neglected diseases and encourage governments to invest money into small biotech companies like us, OET, to produce vaccines for these neglected diseases. And this is how we came across a couple of years ago to start working with CCHF. Moving on to the um, virus itself, it belongs to the genus Nairovirus in the Bunyaviridae family and it has three negative sends, single-stranded RNA segments as genome, as you can see here in the schematic. These um, genomes encode for different uh, viral and structural proteins, and two of the major uh, proteins found on the outside of the virus are GN and GC, which are glycoproteins. And these are the prime target for vaccine generation because they have been shown to uh, induce immune responses in body. Uh, the virus itself only has a single serotype, but it has seven geographically distinct strains, which means that there is slightly different versions of the virus from different, uh, different places in the world. However, these differences are so minute that it is believed that a vaccine against one strain would protect against all seven. So if we move on to our aim as a company, our project aim is to try and develop an economically viable vaccine for CCHF. And it is important to state that we are saying economically viable because I would like to remind you that the main demand is in the low middle income countries. So there is no point for us to generate a really expensive vaccine that is not going to be suitable for uh, the actual required places. So what we are hoping to do is, of course, use our uh, platform of Flashback and uh, use the target genes from the CCHF here, which are the GN and GC, because they have been shown to be the prime uh, targets for vaccine generation, and produce these as a protein subunit vaccine candidate in insect cells. So how we want to do this is that we uh, took the M segment, which is the genome segment that encodes for the GN and GC, and synthesized the gene sequences for either the full-length GN and GC individually, 
or they are truncated version. So a very small part of the uh, protein is deleted, but the majority is still the same. So moving on to giving you a bit more detail about the construct design for our recombinant protein expression. Like I said, there are seven different uh, geographical strains of CCHF. And although these minute changes would not be important for cross protection in a vaccine scenario, they could actually play a quite important role in the manufacturing side. So those slight amino acid changes might improve or uh, make it worse uh, for your protein production in cells. So we wanted to cover all bases and express GN and GC from all seven strains. We also wanted to, like I said, uh, produce both full length and truncated uh, versions of the both proteins. And also the ultimate aim is to purify these proteins. So we get rid of all the cellular contaminants and the vaccine is just the target protein. And to be able to do this, we need different purification tags. Like Adam was saying, there is histidine as a purification tag, there is maltose binding protein tag, there is strep tag. So we got quite a few options. And it is impossible to know which tag will work best with what protein. Hence why we needed to test different versions to be able to optimize the best conditions for production. So now, please don't get scared from the table. I'm not going to go through the whole uh, list, but what I wanted to get across is to be able to test these three main uh, points, we have generated more than 65 different constructs just under a year using the flashback technology. So I just want to get it across that using the flashback technology, you can generate constructs, several constructs in a short period of time, test their expression and also the purification, which is the um, ultimate aim because you can produce large amounts of proteins in cells but if you cannot purify them it's absolutely useless so we had to do this initial screening to produce and purify these proteins and then we could move to the next stage so after all this testing we have um, took four constructs forward which is a combination of full length gn and gc proteins so here, just a quick example to show you that um, actually we did manage to produce this and this is the proof. So uh, just a couple of examples of full length GC and GN and truncated GC uh, production images here. So on top we got Kamasi staining, which is basically a very non-specific staining and you can only see your target proteins if they're produced in high amounts. And this is the proof that we managed to produce our recombinant proteins at high enough yields that we could detect them on the gels. And at the bottom, we got the Western blot images, which is more of a specific detection of your target protein because you're using antibodies to detect the presence of the protein, which was also confirming the production of our targets. So now we know we have produced the proteins. Next thing was to check actually how good they are as a vaccine candidate. So next thing was to test their immunogenicity, which is the most crucial thing before you could move forward as a vaccine candidate. Because if your proteins are not inducing any immune response, you cannot generate a vaccine. So this unfortunately requires animal studies and we at OET do not have the facilities to do this. Therefore, we looked for collaborators. And we were quite lucky to uh, do some collaborations with the Jenner Institute at Oxford University and use their facilities for these experiments. So with discussions with our collaborators, we wanted to address a couple of main project, uh, points in this uh, experiments. So first one was what antigen dose to use. So how much protein do we need to put into the body of an animal to raise an immune response? So we wanted to test a range. We started with 10 microgram and did a tenfold uh, dilution, if you like, to look at one microgram and 0.1 microgram. The next thing is to look at an adjuvant. An adjuvant is a substance that basically helps immune response to recognize a foreign antigen in the body and raise an immune response for it. And as the recombinant proteins cannot enter the cells on their own, 
unlike a viral uh, particle or a bacteria, we do need the use of adjuvants to boost and make the body to recognize that there is a protein in the body and induce an immune response for it. There is quite a lot of different options of adjuvants that can be used, uh, but we have decided to go for Adavax, which is a very commonly used one, and it's a squalene-based oil in water adjuvant. We then also wanted to include MPLA, which is monophospholipid A, and it's a TLR for ag agonist adjuvant. So these work slightly different, but the main aim is the same. And also, we were interested to use our baculovirus budded virus because previous studies has shown indications that baculovirus budded viruses can have an adjuvant effect. Now, this part of the project is more of a research interest for us as an OET because if baculoviruses were to be used as adjuvants, we can very easily uh, produce budded virus particles in the lab every day. So that would be a very interesting point for us to think about producing them as an adjuvant. And the last point we had to consider when we were designing the experiment was to decide what mice to use. So CD1s are outbred mice strains, which means that the response you can get can, can vary. Some mice cannot uh, respond at all. Some mice can respond uh, quite highly. And we wanted this on purpose because this would be a perfect scenario to mimic general population because you cannot guarantee every human will react the same to a vaccine or to a disease. So we wanted to have that mixture and see what kind of profile we get. And the second mice strain we were interested in is a 129s And these are inbred mice. And this means that you're expecting more of a homogeneous um, uh, response from the animals. Although there could be variations, they are inbred, so it should be more homogeneous. But more importantly, other experts working on CCHFB has developed a mouse model. So CCHFB disease model using these mouse strains to study the uh, effects of the virus or test vaccine candidates. So it would be perfect scenario for us to use these animals and see what kind of response we get using our um, vaccine candidates. So thinking about all these points, we have put together this table, which is a very simplified summary of a series of massive experiments. Um, but just to summarize, we wanted to look at the full length and truncated GC and GN as our antigens. And for each antigen, we wanted to test different uh, adjuvants. And again, in each group, we wanted to test 10 microgram, 1 microgram, and 0.1 microgram doses, both uh, in CD1, my strain. And once these experiments were completed, we wanted to use the data from this lot and design the next part to repeat the vaccinations in the A129. Because there is no point to do all this massive experiment in two different cell lines because um, it's not nice to use animals for this testing anyway. So as much as we could minimize their use, that is great. So by getting an answer of what dose is good here, we could apply it to this mass strain and go forward from there. So like I said, this was done in collaboration with Jenner Institute. So moving on to our actual immunization and sampling schedule, just to put it in a bit more context. So in each group I mentioned, we would have eight mice for, per antigen, and we would have two immunizations per group. So we would immunize the mice on day one as a prime, wait three weeks, then get some blood samples, and give the booster immunization. And after that, we will wait 10 days and terminate the experiment by getting the terminal sera and spleens, harvest the spleens of the animals for testing. So why did we get these different types of samples? And this is because uh, the immune responses in the body. So the major immune arms of our system is either the humoral response or the cellular response. Humoral response is the antibody production in the body who can recognize the antigens before they can enter into the cells and hopefully stop 
uh, any reaction. Whereas cellular re responses are more about T cells who can kill infected, already infected cells, for example, or they can feed into helping the B cell sites for the antibody production. And these, um, for CCHF's sake, no one knows yet uh, which part of the immune system is responsible for protection. So it could be either the humoral, cellular, or both. We do not know. Hence why in our experiments, we would like to address both arms. That's why we have collected serum, where we can do ELISA analysis and measure the antibody levels specific to our targets in the serum. Or we could do LA spot analysis, which is uh, processing the spleens of the animals and looking for target specific T cell activation. So serum samples can be collected and frozen and they can be done uh, anal analyzed whenever. Whereas spleen samples had to be collected and processed uh, straight away. And you only get one shot at doing this experiment. There is no more spleens. You only got one animal per uh, experiment, if you like. So that part was quite um, stressful, I must say. It required a lot of planning, uh, but it all went OK. So I will now start and show you some data we got from our ELISA analysis. So I must say, uh, as you can imagine, we had a lot of uh, groups, lots of experiments, which generated tons and tons of data, which is impossible for me to cover in this presentation. Therefore, I've just focused on mainly the GC constructs, uh, just to give you an overview of some of our results. So here on this slide, we are looking at the antibody responses in the CD1 mice which is the outbred mice. And we're looking at the dose response with the Adavax adjuvant. So on the left hand side, we got the full length GC construct. And on the right hand side, we got the truncated GC, so a slightly so shorter version. So if we look, both graph setups are the same. We got 10 microgram dose in blue, one in green, 0.1 in black. And in each experiment, we had a PBS negative control that was injected alongside with the corresponding adjuvant as a negative control. And in the graphs, these individual dots represent individual mice that were present in the uh, groups. And the graphs, the bars here, represents the average response from all eight mice within a group. For the experiment, we also used three different dilutions just to see a dilution response, which we achieved as expected. And looking at the results in general, in both um, construct cases, we have achieved significantly higher responses compared to our PBS negative control, which was a great achievement to start with. If we then look closely, in each group, there is some variations. There are higher responders or lower responders. But overall, we got quite good uh, response. And like I said, this was outbred mice. So we do expect some non-responders and some really good responders. And overall, the most interesting thing uh, outcome from these experiments were the fact that no matter how much protein we injected, we got a really similar response. So we don't need to include 10 micrograms of protein. We can go with one and still get similar responses. So that was quite interesting. Looking at next slide, which is again the CD1 mice antibody responses, this time with the MPLA adjuvant. So exactly the same setup, full length GC, truncated GC. And overall, the results are pretty similar we got uh, a lot higher responses compared to the PBS. And there is not much difference between the um, different doses. It was interesting to see that truncated GC with this adjuvant gave slightly higher responses compared to the full length, which we do not know why, but this is our aim uh, to test anyway. Next, I would like to move on to the antibody responses A in the A129 mice. So like I said, CD1 mice experiments were done first. 
and we have concluded that we don't need to use 10 microgram. So we decided to move forward with one microgram dose of antigen. Hence why here we are seeing all the groups only receiving one microgram of protein alongside the PBS control groups with corresponding adjuvants. We had to test the adjuvants in this mice, both of them, because uh, we wouldn't know how the uh, mice would react with either of the adjuvants. Again, similar setup, we are looking at individual mice as dots and the averages from the graphs. Um, really good responses compared to the PBS groups. And overall, again, comparing all groups within each other, there is not significant difference between the groups, actually. Interestingly, there were some outlier really high responders and from an homogeneous inbred mice, this was quite interesting to see because you expect the data to be more tight like you're seeing here, but um, it is what it is. And it was interesting that the full length GC, sorry, these V2, V, these codes are our own project codes because otherwise it got too complicated. We had more than 65 constructs, like I said. So apologies, these uh, 36 refers to the full length GC with the MPLA, that was slightly lower, but still gave a good enough response. So we were quite pleased with the antibody responses. So next, I want to show you the overall outcomes we had from the Elispot analysis. So these are the spleen processings to look at T cell activation. And here, um, again, I will start with showing you data from the CD1 mice which is the outbred mice and those response with Adavax. So we got the full length GC here and truncated GC there. And with the experiment set up here, I'm not going to go into the details of the experiment, but we require to use these peptide pools to trigger the T cells, the, well, the splenocytes to produce um, certain uh, cytokines, molecules, and that's how we can measure whether there is a target specific T cell activation. And these peptide pools are designed based on our GC constructs. So you can see here in the schematics where each peptide pool is corresponding. And hence why uh, some um, peptide pools will trigger the cells slightly different than the others because it depends on the location in the gene. If we go back to the results here, we got 10, 1, and 0.1 microgram compared against the PBS control group. And we were quite pleased with these results because instantly you're seeing quite good responses compared to the PBS. And the reason we were really happy with this is normally it is quite difficult to induce um, T cell responses with recombinant proteins because normally T cells recognize infected cells. So you need your antigen to get into the cells uh, to really trigger the cellular immune responses in the body. However, here, our recombinant protein, with the help of the adjuvant, was sufficient to produce uh, the T cell responses. Because talking to our expert collaborators, anything about 50 uh, spot forming units would be classed as a positive, potentially protective uh, response. And here, we're seeing more than up to uh, 500 spot forming units. And uh, this was quite promising. And again, uh, one microgram even looked slightly better than the 10 microgram. So it was the right decision to go forward with the one microgram. Next slide, exactly the same setup. So I'm going to go over it quite quickly, but this time with the MPLA adjuvant. Again, we are seeing responses a lot higher than the baseline of 50. And both uh, full length and the truncated GC is responding. And again, like I said too, depending on the region in the uh, genome sequence, uh, uh, gene sequence, sorry, uh, peptide 1 is reacting less than peptide 2, but that is something as expected. Finally, I will move on to showing you the T cell responses from the A129 mice. So this is the strain of mice that people have developed a CCHF mouse model. So we were quite excited to find out the results of this experiment, where we have used only one microgram of the uh, constructs, antigens, um, with either of the adjuvants. And here, 
initially you would say, oh, okay, there is not much response from the full length GC, but I would like to remind you that anything above 50 is potentially a very good response. And although compared to CD1, this is a lot lower, there is still response for full length GC. However, what was more exciting was the truncated GC, especially with the MPLA adjuvant, we are seeing about 1,000 spot forming units, which could be classed as really, really good uh, target specific responses for T cell activation. So this was quite interesting and exciting. Just to summarize the immunogenicity of our two GC constructs in mice, um, our ELISA analysis of the mice sera suggests the production of high level target specific antibodies post immunization. And the ELI spot analysis of the mouse splenocytes um, shows target specific T cell activation post immunization. So this suggests that we have targeted both arms of the immune system. And this is quite good because, like I said, we do not know for CCHF which arm is responsible for protection. And here, we seem to be targeting both. Um, from the different mice strains, you could see that the degree of immune responses can change, and especially with the early spot results from CD1 and A129 mice when we use the full length GC. That was quite interesting to see. And more importantly, we have not observed much differences in the responses generated when different antigen doses were used. So less antigen per dose could reflect to more vaccine doses. And I'm guessing you could put this into more context, thinking about the current pandemic, all the vaccine production, distribution along the whole um, around the world and everything. So imagine you have a certain scale of production, manufacturing capability. And if you were to use 10 microgram of protein, you would have tenfold less doses you could distribute to the world. But we here shown that we could use tenfold less to generate good responses, which automatically reflects to tenfold more doses we can spread around the world. So that's actually quite an important point when you're designing your experiments to look into, because that will, if this ever gets to a point to be approved as a vaccine, that will play a really important role. So it's all good so far. However, the efficacy of these immune responses are not known. So this will only be revealed after we can perform some challenge experiments because these immune responses are good, but they're not guaranteed to protect you from disease. They're indicative that they will be protective, but it is not proven. So this brings us to the next step of the project, which is to determine the efficacy of the candidate vaccines. And we could only do this uh, in a high containment level laboratory. And in England, uh, Public Health England is one of the very little uh, places that can carry this out. So we need a BSL-4 uh, level um, lab setting to handle essentially deadly viruses, because you cannot risk during the experiment for these viruses to escape into the nature. So you need very high level containment. And luckily for us, we had collaboration with Public Health England to help us carry out these experiments. Now, the initial plan in this project was to carry out these um, experiments, challenge experiments, sometime last year. But like you know, pandemic happened and like anything else, plans changed or had to be put on hold because Public Health England had to draw all its attention to focus on COVID-19 and carry out experiments to help uh, generate vaccines or uh, identify diagnostics. So we had to put a pause on our CCHF project with them. But we are quite happy that we have picked up communications again and we are hoping to start this experiment towards the end of this year. So I just want to give you a very brief overview of what we are planning to do. So in these challenge experiments, what's going to happen is that we're going to replicate the initial immunization part like we did with Jenna. So we're going to give our vaccine, wait three weeks, give the second dose. And after 10 days, instead of uh, terminating the mice, what we're going to do is we're going to challenge them. 
which sounds quite horrible, but that would be the only way to tell us whether our vaccines are uh, effective. So during challenge, what happens is that you give the real CCHF virus at lethal doses. So what you find out in the outcome is whether your vaccinated groups are protected from the virus or not. If they are, great, because your vaccine is good. If not, it will be a unfortunate ending, unfortunately. So again, there will be some serum testing for antibody generation throughout the uh, testing, but main outcome will be here. So just to put everything into context in the concluding remarks, hopefully I managed to convince you that using the flashback system, we can very quickly and easily generate and screen several constructs to optimize manufacturing conditions for a certain uh, vaccine candidate or anything else really. Um, and also, hopefully you're convinced that baculovirus insect cell expression system is a safe, safe platform for the generation of candidate subunit vaccines because we have proven that we have produced these proteins in insect cells, isolated them, give them into mice, and we haven't seen any adverse effects. There was no toxicity, so they must be safe. And finally, uh, from the current results that I've shown you, we are quite happy that we got a very strong subunit ca candidate vaccine when we use our GC construct to produce proteins in insect cells because we are seeing high level target specific both humoral and cellular immune responses. So finally, I would like to thank you all for listening. And also I would like to acknowledge all our collaborators that helped us make this project um, possible. And I would like to actually refer to Ms. Melis Gwenso's talk earlier in the morning where she was on about, if you have weaknesses or if you have gaps in your company, ask for help. Otherwise, uh, projects won't come alive. And we knew we couldn't do animal studies and we knew we didn't have the enough uh, expertise for certain parts of the projects. So we have collaborated with all these people and now we are facing a really good outcome and a possible positive product at the end of our uh, project. So that's it. Thank you, everyone. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Doctor, your presentation. We have we have a question for you. Can yeah, sure. Can be a B C mice models uh, be used for this test? Um, could you please repeat the question? Of course, can BALB team mice models be used for this test? Uh, Bulb C mice, yes, yes, sure. So basically, I did not include that due to the time restrictions. But you know, we've generated sixty-five, uh, more than sixty-five constructs. Um, the way that helped us to narrow it down to only four. One was because of the production and purity uh, profiles, but the second one was initially actually we narrowed it down to I think six or eight constructs, and we have done a, a initial immunogenicity study in bulb sea mice with another collaborator, and based on the results from that, we narrowed it down to um, the four main ones. Yeah, so it is possible. Thank you. Uh, other question is. How stable are these recombinant proteins, full length and truncated in vitro? What's the storage condition of the vaccines? And how long does the antibodies remain in the mice post infection? Okay, um, that is actually quite a good question. And you are literally addressing another part of our project that I have not mentioned at all today. But currently, while we are waiting for our challenge experiments to be conducted, we are looking into the stability of the proteins. So just to quickly summarize it, we have produced these proteins freshly and we are storing them at four degrees, minus 20 and minus 80 degrees. And we have a stability testing plan where we started testing them after a week, month, three months, and this will carry on up to two years. So we will do tests like SDS page, Western blot, just to see the profile on a gel. But we will be also looking for protein concentrations and other aspects that are required for the stability. So that's something ongoing at the moment. So I cannot 
tell you exactly how stable they are, but I can tell you it is stable at least up to three months. And I, for the antibodies, I mean, in mice, because the experiments have to be terminated, we cannot monitor up to what level, what period the antibodies will be there for. Um, but in serum, obviously, we freeze them. So uh, we are doing tests after a year and we can detect the antibodies quite clearly. Hope well, that answers your question. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, the question is all that is. Okay, was well, that it? Sorry. Uh, the question is all that is. So okay, thank perfect. You for joining. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you for the questions. Bye bye. Bye bye. Um. Dear participation, please welcome Dr. Zülfiye Yeliz Akkaya Ulum to discuss a project involving microRNAs, their role, and the therapeutic effect on inflammation in the familial Mediterranean fever disease. Hello, good afternoon. Welcome. Thank good you afternoon. so much. Can I start my presentation? Yes, Doctor. Okay, okay, thanks so much. Uh, good afternoon to everybody. First of all, I would like to thank the organization committee and Selin Ojan for inviting me. Uh, it's, it's a great honor to talk in a, such a good organization. Uh, my presentation title is MacRNAs, their role and therapeutic effect on the inflammation in the family Mediterranean fever disease. And I mostly focus on one MacRNA that I am studied on till my uh, from my PhD thesis. So the content of my presentation will be, I will first talk about the, some epigenetic mechanisms and then move on to MacRNAs. Just briefly, I will talk about the autoinflammatory diseases and then McCarney and, and one of the autoinflammatory diseases known as family Mediterranean fever interaction. And it's mostly will be focused on the mechanism and the therapeutic effect uh, of this McCarney's. Just briefly, let me talk about myself. Uh, I graduated from biology department from Ajaytepe University, and then I continued my Master of Science in Faculty of Medicine, Department of Medical Biology, and I continued my PhD in the same department, and I'm working as a research assistant at this department till 2012. And during my PhD, I went to Kalorinska Institute for uh, working of macRNAs in dermatological disorders. And then I come back and completed my PhD at Hajetepe University. And now I'm in uh, National Institutes of Health and for doing my postdoctoral studies. Now it's my second year in my postdoc studies. And the grant that I came to USA was Fulbright grant. Uh, I wanna uh, just little explain this uh, grant, just in case one of you wants to use it to come to USA. It's in here, you can see many type of grants that you can apply for in different level of your academic career. And it's grants, uh, supports the both US citizens and also Turkish Republic citizens. The grants that I use was Fulbright postdoctoral program. And in this grant, you need to have a project. And my project was in vivo delivery and therapeutic effects of candidate McCarnays on autoinflammation. So I 
came here to complete this project. And you can reach more information and the deadlines of this uh, grants in this website. So to turn to my topic, what is epigenetics? I think you all know what is the epigenetics mean from the lessons. It's changes in gene expression without a change in the DNA sequence. And mostly we know three common uh, epigenetic regulation. In, these are in histone modifications and DNA methylation and RNA interference systems. And now we can add this regulation to chromatin remodeling. So these four regulations affect the DNA replication, DNA repair, transcription regulation, and chromatin package, packaging, which all affect the transcription of the genes. And you look for the central dogma here, it all affects the DNA transcription and its, its expression levels of the RNA. And even now you can include like protein modulations that is also not depending on the DNA. It only affects the protein expression level, which is epigenetics factors. But I'm mostly focusing on RNA in this epigenetic regulation mechanism. And macRNAs is a 22 nucleotide, small non-coding RNAs, which are transcribed by the genome. And it's processed in the nucleus and then have a maturation form in the cytoplasma. And we know that they are transcribed by the introns and the exons of coding and non-coding genes. And one macRNA in the cytoplasma is effective on dozens of genes. And in 2021, we know that we have 1917 macRNA sequence, human sequence, uh, which regulates the genes. So, and the mechanism is mostly the inhibition of the translation and the stabilization of mRNA. So it reduces the target gene's expression level and cause the gene regulation by this repres repression. And the other important feature of the macRNA is they can secrete it by the cell. So they transcribe the cell and then go to other cell to the, some other proteins and also cell membrane drape structures like macrovesicles, exosome, and apoptotic bodies and can trigger some pathways in the other cells. And when we look at the autoinflammatory diseases, what are they? In autoinflammatory diseases, we saw the autoinflammation, which is different from the autoimmunity. In autoinflammation, mostly the innate immune cells like neutrophil, monocytes, and macrophage, macrophages play a role. And mostly, all in these autoinflammation regulated autoinflammatory diseases have an IL-1 beta production, which is a very important cytokine in the cell. And in the autoimmunity, autoimmunity, we see that adaptive immune cells have a role, and mostly we see autoantibodies in the cells. Come back to autoinflammatory diseases. What I mean with the IL-1 beta segregation is, in these diseases, there is an inflammasome assembly in the cell, and there can be very different inflammasomes, like you can see here, many different type of inflammasome, and every inflammasome can cause any other autoinflammatory disorders. And after this assembly, after activation of the inflammasome, huge amount of IL-1 beta segregation occurs, and this causes the other cytokine segregation and very inflamed cells in the body. And family Mediterranean fever is one of the most common autoinflammatory disorders, and it's autosomal recessively inherited disease. And the mutated gene of MVFV causing FMF 
disease, which called spirin protein, and which is a very important structure of the pyrin inflammasome. As I mentioned about the importance of the inflammasome in the inflammatory disorders. And you can see that in the patients, there is fever, abdominal pain, and joint pain, swelling, and they can be treated by colchicin and also other cytokine inhibitors. And the important thing that we see in familiar Mediterranean fever is that even though the patients has the same genotype, they don't show the same phenotype. Some patients has a severe, some patients has a mild phenotypes, and this phenotypic heterogeneity is very important in this disease. And we started to think that different modifier factors, such as epigenetic factors, can regulate these variations. And when you look at the overall epigenetics in autoinflammatory diseases, you can see that both monogenic and multigenic disorders can regulate by epigenetic marks through the env environmental factors. And we know that in some autoinflammatory disorders, changes on histone modifications, changes on macRNAs, and changes on DNA methylation dynamics can cause the disease or can make disease to more severe or more mild. So, but in these epigenetics, alteration of macRNAs, we know that cause many disorders. So they can also cause inflammatory disorders or as well, or are they? So when we look at the macRNAs in autoimmunity and autoinflammatory diseases, here you can see that in innate immunity and also in the adaptive immunity that we have two immunity system in the cell, both cells can have uh, both cells in the differentiation or their function. MacRNAs can regulate these cells. Also, when we look at the autoinflammatory diseases, as I said before, inflammasome assembly is a leading of this disease process. So we can see many macRNAs can regulate these inflammasome assemblies and also this IL-1 beta segregation and cytokine segregation. So it's, it's so easily we can say that macRNAs may be cause of these autoinflammatory diseases or maybe just increase this phenotypic heterogeneity. And when I first started to work on macRNAs on FMS, there were only two or three papers. Now from 2021, we see that there are many papers related with macRNAs and FMF, but most of the papers are giving the list of the macRNAs, which are altered, which, which in their expression altered in this disease. So my hypothesis was, what is the function of macRNAs in inflammation in FMF? So I have like a hypothesis to collect the homozygote patients, FMF patients, and compare them with healthy controls. I performed the macroarray and found that these macRNAs are differentially expressed in homozygote patients when compared to control, control patients. And these homozygote patients were not normal patients that can, can be treated by colchicine. They were severe phenotype patients who are resistant to colchicine. So in these patients, there were very huge inflammation in their body. And through this macRNAs that differentially express in these patients, I made a macRNA target genes uh, analysis through the bioinformatic tools called Mirwalk and find these macRNAs possible target genes. And then I cluster these target genes 
in some databases which makes a pathway analysis. And through the pathway analysis, I found that only two macarnays can play a role in the inflammatory process. And when you look at the one macarnay, MIR20, this was increasing the patients when compared to healthy controls. And MIR197 was decreased when you compare with healthy controls. And the fall change was around 5420A and minus 24M197. And then I continued to do the functional analysis. As M197 decreased in patients, I increased M197 with overexpression by using mimic in the cell culture systems. And I decreased the expression of 20A to test how it will affect the inflammation process when we do the opposite. And I perform different functional analysis. So to work on the inflammation and inflammasome complexes, you need to look for inflammation that affects on the cytokine levels. So you can look it by QRT, PCR, or you can look by Western blood or ELISA. And also you need to look for the case phase one enzyme activity, which is very important to segregation of the IL-1 beta, which lead the disease. And also in this auto-inflammation diseases, cell migration is very important as the neutrophils always migrates through the tissue if some inflammation occurs. So one healing and the uh, other migration assay I performed. And the, finally, when they go into tissue, pyroptosis is a kind of cell that is seen in the, in the cell. So I also check the effect on the apoptosis. And through these functional studies, MIR-20A didn't show any significant results related with these pathways. So I move on with the MIR-197 in two different cell lines. And here you can see in the QRT-PCR level, in one of the cell lines, IL-1-beta gene expression level decrease when I overexpress MIR-197 and MVFV gene level also decrease and it was same with the other cell line. So if I overexpress this macarna and it repress IL-1-beta expression level, it means that this macarna has an anti-inflammatory role. So it wants to inhibit the inflammation, but in the patient, its expression level is reduced. So it cannot repress uh, the inflammation process in these patients. And in the cell migration process, when you look at the wound healing assay, here, M197 transfected cells migrated less when compared to mimic control. So they migrated less when I transfected them M197. And here in the TINSORT assay, I'm measuring the cells which is migrating through a transfer and going to bottom of the transfer. And here you can see that in both two cell lines, M197 transfected cells migrated less when you compare them to the scramble mimic control. So it also inhibits migration when it's overexpressed. And when you look at the case phase one activity, it also reduces both in two cell lines and in one cell line. And also, I did all my uh, studies in adult patients, but when I look for the pediatric patients, children patients, I saw that it's also M197 expression level also reduced in the pediatric group when you compare the severe FMA patients with mild FMA patients. So this is some kind of epigenetic regulation didn't alter by the age. And this macarna has some kind of auto anti inflammatory function. So, in macarna studies, the important part is to find the target gene. So, I thought that what, what can be the target gene of this macarna? 
So through the databases, I look for the possible target genes and found that IL-1 receptor 1, which is a receptor for IL-1 beta, can be its target. So I overexpress mu 197 in the cell and look for IL-1 receptor 1 expression. And I saw that as McGarney inhibits their target genes, it was in inhibiting IL-1 receptor 1 expression level. And then I look for the 3 prime UTR luciferase assay to see that if it is really binding to this gene. So I made a mutation in the binding region of this macrone to the to the this gene. And when I made a mutation, it couldn't bind. But when I use the wild type non-mutated region, it can easily bind to macrone and suppress luciferase activity. Then I then I can tell that IL-1 receptor 1 is the one of the target gene of this macRNA. And when I came here in USA for NAH, I made anti-ME197 transfection assay. I did all the premier transfection during my PhD thesis, so I increased the amount of macRNA during my thesis, and afterwards during the publication uh, time, uh, they asked me to inhibit the macRNA. So inhibition of this macRNA means is the same in the patients. See a huge amount of IL-1 beta segregation and it's triggered inflammation processes. So when I look for IL-1 beta in gene expression level, when I treated the cells with antimere, it increased IL-1 beta gene level and send premier 197 as I did before, it suppressed IL-1 beta in gene expression level. And when I look for the other activators, which activates different inflammasome, every time with the antimere transfection, it increase IL-1 beta mRNA level and decrease it following by premier transfection. So when I look for the segregation of IL-1 beta, I saw that when I treat the cells with antimere 197, cells secreted more IL-1 beta. And when I inhibit, uh, when I uh, overexpress this macRNA, then they started to secrete less IL-1 beta. So it shows that this macRNA has a, has a role definitely in an anti-inflammatory way. If you overexpress this, macRNA, it suppresses the inflammation through the IL-1 beta segregation, which is a very key point of the inflammatory processes. And when you decrease this macRNA, as it is in the patient, it may cause, it can cause more inflammation. Then I want to continue with the animal models to see the in vivo effect of this macRNA. And through the years, macRNAs is a good uh, macRNAs is is working on um, many different animal models. And starting from 1993, worms uh, were the good animal models for macRNA research. But from 2007, we can work on mice and their macRNA effect on mice. But there are not many autoimmune and autoinflammatory diseases models for mice. It's mostly work for the cancer type of models. But still, there are some, some models that we can count. And also, through the working with the mice, it's the important pi uh, part is the delivery of the macRNA. So you need to target, for example, in the autoinflammatory diseases, monocytes neutrophils type of cells so this delivery is is the most important part that you need to find the best delivery method to work on these models and macRNAs as we know their function they can mostly use for the diagnosis and the prognosis of the disease but as they can cause the disease they also can be used for the treating of the disease so it may it, this makes the macRNA as a therapeutic agent of the disease. So 
when you look at the therapeutic usage, you can see that they can, in, if it is overexpressed in one of the disease and cause disease, you can block the macaronis with ansimere delivery. Or if it if its expression decreasing, causing the disease, you can restore it with using mimic macaronis drugs. And there are many clinical trials uh, for macaronis. Now you can reach uh, many clinical trials which are in their phase two levels, which is very promising for a macaronis to be a therapeutic agent. And here, not only for autoinflammatory disorders, but you can see in many huge variety of disease, you can use this macaronis as a therapeutic, including heart failure, cardiac repair, fibrosis, and inflammation as well. And the laboratory that I came in NIH was in the National Human Genome Research Institute, and in this institute, mostly they are working on the genetics regulation of the disease, but, but they also have the functional studies facility, which they have the mice model of the disease that I work on. It's called FMF Nakin mice model. And the scientists established this mice model with a homozygote mutation of B72. Uh, 6A, which is the one of the common mutations that we see in FMF, and cause the uh, inflammatory phenotype in this mice. So I started to work on the macrophages isolated from the mice and see if it if MIR197 affect the inflammation process in these cells called uh, bone marrow derived macrophages. And then if it shows something significant in vitro, I plan to continue with the in vivo models and transfect the Mi197 through some delivery methods to mice and see if the mice phenotype can be rescued. But when I came here, I found that um, in mice, there is not anymore Mi197 expression level. So when you look at a database called MIRBase, you can see the sequence of the macaronase and also if the macaronase can be transcribed by the mice or human. So you can have this information here. But in, in it says for the mice, that entry. So they found that there is no transcription of MIR197 in mice. So it means that if there is no transcription, Maybe there is no target gene of this macaroni. So if I send this macaroni to mice, maybe because of lack of target genes, it cannot have a role in inflammation process. But still, before I came here with the Fulbright project, when I was writing it, there was a mice mu 197 expression. And so I look for the sequence for this mouse uh, mu 197 and it's 100 identical with the human sequence. So I thought that maybe if I use this human primers, maybe I can find some Mi197 expression levels in mice, even though the database says the opposite. And I look for the Mi197 expression, uh, Mi197 transcripted gene region, and so that some, some of this Mi197 uh, seven coding region can be amplified, but when I sequence this region, it turns out that it cannot be made a functional Mi197, which is which can be matured in the cytoplasma. So it, it it shows that it's not really expressed in mice. But still, I continued to use the human Mi197 mimic the overexpression agent on the mice cells, both in FMF Nakin mice and wild type mice, to see that maybe it can affect through some target genes we don't know. So I isolate the bone marrow macrophages and then differentiate them to 100% to macrophages in the cell culture, and then transfect them with MIR197. And here you can see that prior one beta expression level 
decrease in a not very significant way, but still some inhibition occurs in the uh, uh, mice cells. And in another experiment set up with FMF Nakin mice, here you can see also the prior one beta protein level decrease when I transfected them with mu 197 And as I expected, the target gene that I found in human cell line was not the target gene in my cells because after mu 197 transfection, there were no difference in the protein level of mu 197 So it can somehow affect IL-1 beta in a protein level with some other target genes. And when you look at the IL-1 beta segregation out of the cell, after premier transfection, it reduced a lot of this IL-1 beta segregation. And through the different activators of the inflammasome complex, uh, within mice cells, macrophages, it also reduced IL-1 beta segregation in two different activators. So it means that in mice, it can still effect in a cell culture in vitro model, it can still suppress IL-1 beta expression level. So why not sending this macRNA to mice? And then I continue to work on the macRNA delivery methods, which methods will be the best, best to send the macRNA to mice. And through this uh, macRNA delivery methods, mostly the scientists try to make the uh, stable of the macRNA, but this stability cannot make the macRNA to, to go to the target gene. Target gene a uh, target cells because cells should recognize the other cells and then intake this structure into the cell and then macRNA can make some function in the cell. So I choose this cell drive membrane vesicles derivative method. And from these one, I select macrovesicles. Because macrovesicles seems that they are all cell-derived membrane vesicles, which are made from the own mice cells in my experiment setup. So they cannot cause any low, uh, they cannot cause any cytotoxicity or antigenity. They cannot treat they cannot trigger the immune system and they can easily go to the target cells in my case they are hematopoietic stem cells and then the cells can intake these membrane cell membrane drive mesicles easily so this can be the very efficient delivery method for the macRNA so the thing that i done was to culture these macrophages that I were isolated from mice and then load macRNAs inside these vesicles and then send it back to macrophages again to see if the cells intake these macrovesicles. And I send it empty vesicles and vesicles with mi 197 and vesicles loaded with mimic control. And for isolation of this, macrovesicles, I use three different um, methods that you can find in the literature. So I select the uh, third method and go with that one. And in with this density grand, gradient centrifugation, centrifugation, I isolate macrovesicles and then electroporate them outside with mu 197 and mimic controls and treated the cells with these loaded macrovesicles and then look for the mu 197 expression level. And here you can see in my first setup, I increased 97 fold change of this mu 197 transfection into the mice with these macrovesicles. And in my second setup, it increased 164 fold change of this macRNA expression level in the mice cells. And in the overall result, it seems that it can increase more than 100 fold change in the mice models. So, the next aim of this to send these macro vesicles, transfected macro vesicles, we may call them loaded macro vesicles, on mice 
and to see that if the mice has uh, some phenotypic differentiation, uh, phenotypic differentiation, which show that phenotypic rescue from the disease. So I will look for the weight of the mice and also some IL-1 beta segregation in the mice if it is reduced after this transfection. So I will continue to test the in vivo effect of this macRNA on mice. And the other thing that it's worth to mention is to studies of while why one macRNA expression level is changing in a disease state. So why is one macRNA expression level reducing some disease while one of the other macRNA expression level increase? So if it is caused by the disease or disease caused the this differentiation and alteration in the macRNA. So it can be through some different pathways actually. It can be some variations in the macRNA coding gene. It affects the expression level of macRNA. Or it can be some transcription factors that affect the macRNA expression level after the disease state occurs. Or it can happen before the disease state and can cause the disease itself. And through this transcription regulation, it can be also effective in the maturation steps. So maybe after some disease happened, a state occurred, then it affects that process and then cause the reduction of a macRNA or increase of a macRNA. So I thought that why me 197 expression level change in the FMF disease and think that maybe some variation in the coding gene of this macRNA is it is in the genome can cause this low expression of this macRNA. So I look at the, some patients, their exome sequencing data, if if there are some variations of the genes, but I couldn't find any variation. So it means that the coding sequence is normal in the patients, but then something happened in the transcription level of this macRNA and cause, you know, cause the decrease of this macRNA, and then it triggers more inflammation. So the future plans will be about this project and my postdoctoral studies is to complete the mice experiments with in vivo delivery studies. And I'm also searching for a new target gene studies for this macRNA. So I perform RNA sequencing. And also I wonder uh, this macRNA function in other diseases, mostly in other autoinflammatory disorders, and also the other diseases may be led by the inflammation this macRNA can have a role in. And the last part that I will continue to work on the investigating the reason of the alteration of the expression of this Mu197 in patients. So thank you so much for listening to me. And I would like to thank you to my colleagues, my PI, to help me to work on this project. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. And can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay, thank you for your presentation. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, thank you all for attending the symposium today. We are so glad to have you in the audience. The first day of our symposium has ended and we, we, will, we will see you tomorrow. I'll catch you in a voice.